What if I had told you that there's one biblical principle that can turn this, this rock, into this? Gold and silver. Stay tuned, I'll share you how in this episode of The Seven Fears Quite Happening in three, two, one. Let's go. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jada. Steady through the rigor. Yeah, I'm getting bigger. Just fighting in them trenches, now I'm making seven figures like. What's cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy Matt Zapala here, hailing to you from the Money Smart Home Office here. And this episode of The Seven Figure Squad Scripture Series, by the way, Clinton, put up his, uh, put up his uh, answer here. Clinton, we're still looking for you, buddy. You won $500 from us, and we'd like to compensate you as well as give $500 to your church or charity, but you got to reach out to us, buddy, but you helped us create the inspiration behind the new name for these biblical Bible studies on Sundays on the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel called the Seven Figure Squad Scripture Series, thanks to you, but we need to have you reach back out to us. Please send us your information here based on his website, but thank you again, Clinton, for helping us create the inspiration for the new name for this Biblical Bible study here on Sunday. It's called the Seven Figure Squad Scripture Series. So, all right, what am I talking about with this episode? So, at the shooting of this video here in 2021, this uh, 100 ounce bar of silver goes for about $3,000. And this uh, 10 ounce gold bar goes for approximately $18,000 based on today's exchange rate. A little bit can come from something as simple as this. What am I talking about? The biblical principle that turns this into gold and silver is this thing called conflict. Yes, that's right, conflict. So if you say, man, Lord, I'm a rock, okay? By the way, what did Jesus say to Peter? He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So there's the significance about what a rock can do in one's life and the significance of what conflict can do in your life, let me explain. There's two types of conflict that we can experience in our lives, two types, let me break it down. It's called creating and contributing to your own conflict. In other words, you're your own mess. Or number two, the mess that others create. But each one of those two conflicts is something that we all will experience frequently, quite frequently actually, in our lives, especially if you want to go down the journey becoming a first generation cash flow millionaire or down the journey just being financially free. So you gotta know that any type of relationship you create, your relationship with God, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your children, your relationship with your business partners, the relationship you have with your community, anytime you spend a significant amount of time with them or the situation, guess what it eventually arise? Conflict. And what I've watched, what I've seen, what I've witnessed in my 22 years as an entrepreneur is those that can embrace and get through conflict ends up becoming financially free and definitely those that become a first generation cash flow millionaire. So again, two types of conflict that we can experience in our lives, one that we create ourselves and we contribute to, or number two, the conflict that other people create. So what is the purpose behind conflict? What is the purpose behind conflict? Look, I was holding up a rock here earlier, but inside this rock, once you put enough heat and fire and temperature behind this type of rock, behind this type of rock that has traits of gold and silver and copper, guess what happens? it melts away those precious metals away from the rock and then you end up with pure gold, pure silver, pure character, pure spirit, pure attitude towards the things that God, you feel that God has called for you in your life. And so the, again, the purpose of conflict is to refine our character. What am I talking about? It reveals for us to use many different things. So therefore we can see patience working in our lives. We can see faith working in our lives. We can see perseverance, loyalty, integrity, courage, and love happening in our lives once we put ourselves under conflict, which creates heat, fire, a high amount of temperature. So therefore we can spill through the refinement what God has placed in our lives. You know, oftentimes we see uh, people that win all the time, win all the time, win all the time. Ah, oh, they're the champion, are awesome, they can do a lot of things. Here's my biggest fear for a lot of people that constantly win all the time, win all the time, win all the time. Like we just watched the uh, March Madness uh, uh, basketball tournament, and uh, I was wondering how Gonzaga was going to deal with uh, either win or victory. And sadly, Gonzaga lost. And you know why? And here, here's my little weird assessment of why. Because throughout the whole entire season, 
They've won. They've won. They've won. They've been ranked number one. They've been ranked number one. They've been ranked number one. But they never had a loss. Not to say they haven't deal with adversity, but the deepest level of adversity, in my opinion, is when you deal with a loss, the pain, the hurt, the toughness that has to be developed after suffering a loss. And oftentimes, when people are constantly winning all the time, winning all the time, winning all the time, they don't necessarily how to deal with a setback, therefore never experiencing and exposing the refinement of such character, and that eventually down the road, dealing with conflict. Because didn't you see the game, right? When the push came to shove, guys were getting injured, guys were creating unnecessary fouls, guys, their bodies were out of shape, because throughout the entire season, they never dealt with that level of toughness that Baylor gave to them, and therefore, Baylor won, and they became the national champions for the first time ever in that school's history. So congratulations to Baylor. By the way, I'm not from Texas. I'm from Chicago. I'm just a fan of sports. I'm a fan of anybody that deals with conflict and rises above. I'm a big fan of the underdog story. So here are some choices that we have with conflict, however. Here's some choices. Number one, you could be discouraged with conflict. Oh my gosh, what was me? I can't believe this is happening to me. I got denied my credit again. You know, uh, the pastor said this, and God has an, he hasn't answered my prayers. You can get angry. You can wrestle with God. You can demand things on God, demand, de demand things that people you know, feel that they owe you certain things, that, uh, that certain situations aren't coming away. You can be angry. You can be discouraged. Woo, woo, woo. You can be bitter, and therefore increasing the magnification of such loss that you are experiencing or second choice that you have in terms of dealing with conflict is you continue to express patience and understand there's a long-term benefit for this conflict that you're going through, this adversity that you're going through. And in the process, guess what you do? Instead of getting bitter, you are getting better. Instead of magnifying and increasing the loss that you're facing, now you're getting stronger along the way. Major choices that you have when dealing with conflict. Again, the choice is yours. And since God has given you Free will, it's up to you. That's the decision you got to make. So what is King Solomon? By the way, I've been going through the series here written by Stephen K. Scott called The Richest Man Who Ever Lived. I suggest you buy this. You can buy this on Amazon. I believe we'll have the links in the description column below. But uh, a phenomenal book here on the work of King Solomon. Again, the wisest and richest king who ever lived. And uh, when we're looking at what King Solomon did, when I was reading the Bible, I was you know, I first came to my faith and I started reading the Bible. I started looking at the Old Testament because, you know, we've always been hearing about New Testament. So I was looking through the Old Testament in my own personal journey and in my faith walk. And I started seeing the different gems, the one-liners of this book called Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And I realized, whoa, he's talking about money here. He's talking about business. He's talking about entrepreneurship here. And like, whoa, all these things are in the Bible? And so Stephen K. Scott, in his book, The Richest Man Who Ever Lived, really unpacks a lot of these problems. And let's go over some of these. Five causes of conflict. Number one is pride. The reason why you're going through a lot of conflict or lacking the skill set to deal with conflict is because of pride. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. It reads like this. Pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. So oftentimes people debating, 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 and the debating turns into an argument. Oh, you got to see things my way. No, you got to see things my way. Why? Because of pride. The second thing, the second cause of conflict is anger. Let's read here. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 18, it reads like this. A hot-tempered man stirs up dissension, but a patient man calms a quarrel. No, by the way, I've been very guilty of this, but if you get very guilty of this, by no means am I anywhere close to any form of perfection by far. I'm the most flawed, most mistakes I've ever had in my life. By the way, I believe I can write a whole thesis on conflict because I was a single father. I was married, divorced. I was a single father, raised three kids, ran a business, no college degree, started a business, failed a couple businesses. Uh, had many, many relationship failures after that, business failures after that, personal failures after that. I can write you a pretty decent thesis on conflict. And one of them that I had issues with was dealing with anger. And again, it reads back here in the scriptures, a hot tempered man stirs up dissension. And I didn't realize I was doing that to myself. And I've been guilty of, how many guys have been guilty? Come on, right now, don't judge me. I promise I won't judge you. But how many of you are guilty with road rage? <laughs> Road rage. I mean, there's even movies about road rage and people being pissed off that 
they got cut off and this, this, and that. And how about just leaving church and uh, you're going through the parking ministry and you're upset that certain people are in your way getting out of the parking lot because you're late for the barbecue, you're late for the party. And you're like, hey, hey, get out of my way. I just left church, completely forgot what the pastor talked about. And here you are, forgot about your testimony just in the parking lot minutes after church service is done on Sunday. Why? Because of anger. And I've learned this over time. You cut me off? No problem. Listen, I believe that at a certain age for a man, there's really no point of getting in a fist fight. I mean, it's not like you're growing up. It's not like, you know, in your tw you're tw 25, 30 years old. And I mean, if you kept with the same old, same old, I, I get it why you get in a fist fight. But listen, if you're married, you got kids, you're leading a family, you're leading your children, what the heck are you doing getting in fist fights for? I get it, certain people are being disrespectful and this and this and that, but at the end of the day, what's the problem with somebody saying, you know what, I cut you off and, hey man, knock yourself out, okay? My family's safe, my kids are safe. You could have gotten into an accident, you could have cut me off and hit my car. But you know what, just because you cut me off doesn't mean that I gotta come back at you and say, hey man, you cut me off, next thing it turns into road rage. I mean, what's the point? Again, conflict is either you create that or you contribute to that or the other things that others create. But here's the thing, the choice is yours whether or not to let anger rise up and cause you to express the worst of things. Number three, harsh words. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse one. It reads like this. A gentle answer turns away wrath. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. See, oftentimes, especially, how many times have you guilty of this? You send each other the wrong words via text message. Right? That's why I feel that conflict via text messages, arguments via messages, emails, Facebook messages, DMs, it's probably the worst way, one of the worst ways to communicate. Why? Because there's no feeling about it. There's no physiology about it. I can't see you. I can't feel you. You're not in my presence. And it might interpret your words the wrong way. And what may seem as an easy word based on somebody's attitude and how they read it, then turns into a harsh word, then causing more conflict. Number four, impulsive reactions. Look at Proverbs chapter five, verse eight. It reads like this based on a King James version. What you have seen with your eyes do not bring hastily to court for what you will do in the end if your neighbor puts you to shame. So in other words, oftentimes, especially in this litigious society, people start angry at what they're impulsive. I'm going to sue you. I'm going to get you. Contact my lawyer. You're going to hear from my lawyer. All these things back and forth. You're going to hear from my people. You're going to hear from my people. What happens though? in that scenario where you're using impulsivity. You're just like impulsive because you're knee-jerk reaction to anger or conflict because you're pride. All these things put together are causing you to be impulsive about bringing somebody to court. What happens then if they find out you're wrong? So be careful about the things that you do impulsively. Number five, being a busybody. What am I talking about? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 26, verse 17. It reads like this. Like one who seizes a dog by the ears is a passerby who meddles in a quarrel, not on his own. I mean, have you ever met a strange dog and you just try to grab it by its ears? What do you think that dog is going to do? <laughs> it's going to defend itself. It's going to protect itself. Same thing happens when you are not minding your own business. You're being a busybody and you start getting involved in other people's business. You stick your nose in certain things, or worse, you share things that you heard about other people. You spread gossip, and guess what? You cause conflict, and worse, in that scenario, you're bringing in, you're introducing in a lot of people. And sometimes there's people out there just make a living doing that. And you wonder why they're not happy. They wonder why, man, why come my life is such a mess? Why is my life, why is nothing good coming my way? Because you sit in a life filled of conflict. And based on that conflict, it's not conflict that's good either. These, this isn't good conflict. Okay, so with that being said, how do you use conflict then to win and overcome the situation? And just like that rock I shared with you earlier, how do you refine yourself to gold and silver? Let's check this out. Number one, offend or not. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19. It reads like this. An offended brother is more unyielding than a fortified city. And disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. Sometimes when people feel offended, man, all they're going to do for the rest of their lives is going to troll you, drop rumors about you, because why? They felt offended. So if you want to have conflict, do you want to sit there and offend somebody? Or you want to put yourself in a situation where you say, you know what? Let bygones be bygones, and so what if they win? Are they disrespecting me? 
Are they taking away from me? Are they stealing from me? Are they doing that to other people? If not, hey, let them live in their own mess. So offend or not offend, the choice is yours. Because you know, once you offend somebody, man, an offended brother is more unyielding than a fortified city. Or number two, do you use conflict to improve or do you use conflict to worsen? Again, the outcome of conflict is to have a better outcome. You don't want the conflict to get worse. So if you're going to get involved in conflict, you're gonna be in a situation of head to head. At the end result, is it going to be that we're winning out of this thing or you and I are just worse enemies? We've strayed apart. We're never gonna see each other again. What is the outcome? Again, use conflict to improve a situation and not worsen it. Number three, seek counsel. What does Proverbs chapter 20 verse 18 say about that? It reads like this. Make plans by seeking advice. If you wage war, then obtain guidance. See, uh, oftentimes when people are saying, you know what, I'm gonna go after this person, I'm gonna create this video, I'm gonna write this blog, I'm gonna make a phone call, I'm gonna say this publicly or to a person and I know it's gonna get out and about. Are you sure you're gonna do that? Are you seeking counsel? Are you careful with the words that come out of your mouth? Because again, as we discussed last week, your words can either give life or death. The power of the tongue is extremely important and it can add to your life or it can take away from your life through the best areas of conflict or in this scenario, what we're talking about is the worst areas of conflict. Number four, attack the argument, not the person. See, oftentimes what people are saying, especially in this world right now, debates. You know, we use debates very frequently in our office. We use debates very frequently in what we do in terms of business, our family. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? Are you sure? Let me be, let me, let me play the opposite side real quick. So therefore we find out the real true sense of an argument or the right play for a particular decision that we're making. But things get kind of heated, especially in the areas of religion, politics, money, relationships. And instead of attacking the argument, people then start attacking the person. So if you want conflict to improve you, keep it based on the conflict. I remember watching some of the presidential debates and I remember one of the uh, uh, politicians was attacking the presidential candidate. And I'm like, like, wow, you really said that about this person? I was just waiting for this person to come out and just blow this person up based on his reply to that debate. But here's what I saw the other person do. I saw him take a breath, calm, Boom, answered, smart answer, well-to-do answer, and that person I saw later got voted to be president and vice president of the United States of America, and I appreciated the way they set an example for me to overcome conflict, especially in a debate. We're looking to see who to vote for and how that president and vice president responded based on the attacks from the other side. Uh, it was a very well-to-do, very impressionable thing for me as a, a young voter at the time, a young, uh, young adult at the time, to see that type of maturity happen. Number five. Don't drop secrets. What am I talking about? <laughs> Proverbs chapter five, verses nine through 10. It reads like this. If you argue case with a neighbor, do not betray another man's confidence. Oftentimes you're having a conversation with somebody else and that's in confidence, in secrets between you and that person. It's not fair for that particular person to hear what somebody else says Somebody else says that you had with somebody else in confidence with them. Next thing you know, you're dropping names, you're dropping dimes. You're ratting them out. And next thing you know, you're creating a necessary conflict. And next thing you know, you're creating more people that be working against you versus with you. And your problem just got worse because you created more conflict. And it's not the right conflict that you want to create. Because again, the outcome of that is to do what? Because you don't have an argument for yourself. You got to drop the secrets that you had in confidence with other people to potentially win your argument that's weak and again based on proverbs here chapter 25 verses 9 through 10 do not share the secrets that you have that you've extended with somebody else with another person or with another source have it with yourself you might win temporarily here's the crazy crazy part of that situation you just might win temporarily you might win an initial argument my friends you're going to lose the long-term war when it comes to that type of situation. Again, you might win short term, but you're gonna lose the long-term war when it comes to that scenario. Number six, don't extend the conflict. What does Proverbs chapter 26, verse 20 say about not extending conflict? It reads like this. Without wood, a fire goes out, but without gossip, a quarrel 
dies down. So what you've done is once you debated a certain scenario, you're not adding necessary, unnecessary, unnecessary feelings because of pride kicking in, anger kicking in. You just want to be hurtful and deceitful with your words just so you can win. But as soon as the argument's over, kissy, kissy, make it up, handshake, whatever case be, fist bump, elbow bump, whatever you got to do. But don't add more fuel to the fire. Don't add more wood to the fire to cause more unnecessary conflict. Once the conflict is resolved, the outcome is had, boom, move on. We learn together. We live life. And number seven, in ways to win and overcome adversity. Number seven, give an unexpected gift. What? Does that really say uh, that in the Bible? Sure. Let's look at Proverbs 21, verse 14. It reads like this. A gift given in secret soothes anger. So I remember uh, uh, there's many times, especially for you folks, married folks, business partners, you've been mar uh, married and been in an extended relationship together. And next thing you know, boom, here's a gift. What's some easy examples? Trying to overcome conflict? Here, babe, here's some flowers. Here's some chocolate. Here's a spa day. Get your nails done. Get a foot massage. Uh, uh, fellas, you know, uh, we get our hair, uh, we, we, we get taken up because, hey, you know, babe wants to take you out to a movie, wants to take you out to a ball game, want to go out for some, uh, uh, some, some wings, whatever the case may be. Some simple gestures like that to overcome conflict unexpectedly. And remember, a gift given soothes anger. And uh, here's one last one as I wrap stuff up. Here's one last one. At the end of the day, with all this stuff going on, sadly, with so much conflict going on in America, so much anger and sadly hate going on in America, I think one of the biggest things, one of the biggest things that we can all do to resolve all this and win and have an outcome is to forgive, is to forgive. And you think that you're forgiving somebody for them, right? But you're actually forgiving somebody for you, so therefore, you don't hold resentment. You don't hold pride and anger and harsh words. You forgive to let go. Say, so you know what? This person here said certain things about me. Is, is it something I'm going to be worrying about here three, four, five years from now? Probably not. So let's resolve this. If they don't want to resolve, no problem. I've forgiven them. And, uh, you know, Nelson Mandela, when I'm thinking about this, every time I think about forgiveness, I think about what happened to Nelson Mandela and how powerful his words was when he was released from prison and uh, he still forgave. He still forgave the conflict. He still forgave the people that imprisoned him. And what he did to unify his country, phenomenal stuff. Imagine 25 plus years of your life gone because somebody's wrong. There was an injustice happening. And you still have the strength and fortitude to come out and say, and still say, I forgive. So one of my favorite quotes from Nelson Mandela, using the word forgiveness, he says it like this. Forgiveness liberates the soul. It casts out fear. And that's why... It's a very powerful weapon. And think about what we did to this country. And think about what forgiveness can do for you. The people that wronged you, the people that uh, did an injustice to you, can you still have the strength and fortitude to live in what God would have you to do and say, you know what? If I can forgive so many other people, why can't you forgive the person that insulted you, that wronged you? Now, by the way, I'm not saying that you should stick up for yourself. I didn't say that you should be bullied. Of course not. But if you want to resolve this conflict, and stick up for yourself and do things in a certain way. At the end of the day, the outcome is we got better and I can still live in this world forgiving you and moving on forward and still seeking what the next chapter of God has in our lives as we seek financial freedom, as you seek wealth, prosperity, success, and happiness by embracing and knowing that conflict eventually will continually be always in our lives. With that being said, guys, I love to know your thoughts. Your questions, your feedback, drop them in the comment section below. How has conflict operated in your life? Have you been the type of person that's creating your own conflict, that you're contributing to your own conflict, or you've been living in a position where other people are creating conflict on you? The choice is yours, however, of what you're going to do when that conflict comes your way. Before I let you go, check out these other videos right here called Three Biblical Habits That Made Me a Millionaire, and also the book that made me a millionaire. What am I talking about? My favorite book of the Bible, Proverbs. And of course, his other book, Ecclesiastes, written by King Solomon, the wisest and richest king who ever lived. With that being said, guys, thanks for tuning in. Again, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notification. Be alerted next time we upload our next episode. The YouTube channel is designed to help you think like a millionaire, strategize like a millionaire, so therefore you can become a first-generation cash flow millionaire. That being said, guys, I'm a mighty smart home office. I'm a mighty smart guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be mighty smart today. God bless you guys.
Thank <laughs> you.